Welcome back to Robin Leach Talking Food. I'm Bill Boggs, and with us right now is Mr. Hugh Downs, one of the most familiar faces on American television and the author of this book, 52 Forever. Pleasure to have you with us, Hugh Downs. Good to be here, Bill. But right, before we get into the book, you know, you work with Barbara Rollins every yeah. uh, 2020. Yeah. You get along okay with Barbara? Oh, yeah, yeah. You've worked with her for off and on? Uh, over a quarter century. No know? kicking under the table? <laughs> no, no. no. In fact, I can't recall. We've had differences of opinion, but never any rancor, never any uh, acrimony. Right. Well, you always, you, you, pers yeah. you seem to give off the vibration of a person who uh, is a conciliatory type man, isn't it? Yeah, I think I try to, uh, I try to compromise. I think it's better than, uh, I don't like to compete against people. I don't like to... Uh, I don't like to try to force my way, and I get my way more that way than I would if I tried to force it. I now, suppose. where did you learn that? That's a, it's a, it's a, that's a wonderful <laughs> thing for many have, people to observe. I have no idea. Maybe by example, my father was sort of that way. You know, he, he didn't. Uh, uh, he he got along with people very well, also, and uh, I think he taught me something that was interesting. An awful lot of competition in this world ought to be ought to be translated into cooperation. And I found uh, in the last half of my career life, I have never competed against anybody. By doing the opposite and helping them, I find then you, you create such goodwill that they kind of boost you along and move you up. And I said, well, that's a wonderful way to do it. That is a great, you know, I, I have, have to uh, pull a line out of the Godfather that's only partly related to that when the, the God, Marlon Brando says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> yeah, for... For a reason. <laughs> for that reason. In that business, I guess you had to. But the television business, I mean, you have, uh, have truly one of the most successful careers in the history of our medium, being on very early on. And yet, it is, at times, a cutthroat business, a brutal business. Yeah. You have Leo DeRocher, God bless him, saying, you know, nice guys finish last. You appear to be one of the nice guys. There <laughs> well, had to be times when you had to go to war. I don't think so. I, no? you, there are times when you have to draw a line and say, if this cuts across my integrity, I won't do it. But usually people uh, respect that, and uh, it doesn't necessarily cause rancor. There have been, there have been people I've dealt with that, where I played amateur psychiatrists and thought I could charm them out of a right. neurotic uh, hostility, uh -huh. and that's, false. that's wrong. That doesn't work. And so that your, your, your technique at that point would have been to try to help them to figure themselves out. Yeah. Because they were giving you a problem. I'm going to solve this problem. I know. By it's this. arrogant on my part to think that I could uh, solve somebody's neurosis by my own amateur methods. Right. But I'll tell you, such people are very rare. Very rare, really. Right. Most people, even that seem a little abrasive in the business, are decent human beings. And treated right, they'll treat you right. Yeah, that's a good thing. What goes around, what does go around, comes yeah. around. Would you not agree? The, I, you've I agree seen with that. the people yeah. who have really dealt out the bad stuff frequently? Exactly. Nothing is sadder than somebody who has climbed the ladder of success by stepping on people's faces on the way up, because the way down is pretty sudden and yeah. <laughs> drastic for yeah. them. Now, speaking, of, speaking of faces, as, as the years have passed, you, re, you left the Today Show in yeah. 1971. I mean, I was, I, in reading your book, I was reminded that right. you left in 71. And at the time, you weren't calling it a retirement, but Everyone else did. The press took that up. The press know, took it as a retirement. Yeah, I suppose in a way it, re it amounted to that. And the problem is, I had I had sort of retired once before briefly. And then that second time, I remember that uh, my secretary said to me at one point, I was out in Arizona and I had bitten off more than I could chew because I was uh, teaching at Arizona State and I was a visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. I was writing two books. I, I was doing all of this stuff. And she said once, I wish you'd go back to work. You'd have more free time. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. When I went back into a, with a contract, I had more free time. Right. So when you, but it seems to me, uh, and I could be wrong, as I look at the, the second phase of your life since you came back on the public television on Easy Over, a wonderful okay, okay. show that it really showed everyone your interest in, in aging. Yeah. PBS Live from Lincoln Center, a landmark and a wonderful music series, and now for many, many years, 2020, that you've done some of your finest work in this stage of your life. Yeah, I think so. Better than I, you like to look back and think you always did the same kind of uh, same quality work. But I've heard recordings of myself and seen kinescopes long long ago, and I wonder why anybody hired me. Well, what did you see that you didn't like? As you look back, the rerun one in your head. I and... saw a self consciousness. I saw a uh, a little bit of flavor of how am I doing instead of what am I doing, which is a very bad right. thing. You got to pay attention to what you're doing and not worry about how you. You know, and as a radio announcer, I know I I didn't even get off the runway until I got over that idea of paying, paying attention to the pear-shaped tones, you know. You, if right. you do that, you're dead. You've got to forget your voice. Incidentally, I used to always worry about my voice because I, I, I guess in those days also I was smoking. I quit that. That's, that's good. But 
uh, I was concerned about my voice. As soon as television came along, I was concerned about my appearance, and I forgot about my voice, and my voice got better. You know? right. So I, the, the lesson there is like Zen archery. You just forget about everything, and you're And, and, and you're in the off. moment. But I started yeah. to say, in terms of the aging process and being on camera and competition from other younger men and yeah. women coming along, has that been something that has stung you at all, or have you pretty much never. been able to go your own way? Yeah, never has. As a matter of fact, this sounds corny, but I, I did evolve the idea a while back that you should you have to build armor in this business because it's going to be very bruising, as you know. But you shouldn't build calluses because armor will protect you, but it doesn't destroy your sensitivity. Calluses destroy your sensitivity, and I think then you're kind of damaged as a human being. And and with the result of you, you have armor against the slings and arrows. Right. Uh, but within that setup you can you can be cooperative and you can help people my feeling is if somebody came along who was a going to do a competitive thing to what i do on the air maybe one of the adventure pieces say you right. know, they want somebody want to do something on aerobatics and or scuba diving or something i would help them i i, I would just feel like if i make them look better well, that's in the long haul somehow going to make me look better well this that it's almost like a principle of judo use the force that is coming yeah, at you yeah. now yes, you sir. have had some amazing adventures on the air you actually Again, I read this in the book. I had forgotten this one. You actually went on an expedition to the South Pole and moved the flag yourself. Isn't that amazing? That was one of the high points of my life, Bill. The, the, the South Pole wasn't in the right place. <laughs> I and know. the scientists in charge of that, you know, the National Science Foundation, I found out that they were going to, uh, once I was set to go down there, they, I had read about uh, changing the pole because polar satellites allowed a more refined measurement. And I said, w when are you going to do that? And uh, on the phone to Washington, right. and they said, oh, in December. I said, I'm going to be down there in December. Only half seriously, I said, I'd love to be the guy that moves it. I think it was more than half so, seriously. So, well, they called me, yeah, maybe it was. <laughs> and they called me back a couple of weeks later and said, we talked to the scientists down there, and they think that's a good idea. So I've got it on film that on December 10th, 1982, I moved the South Pole to this proper position. And, and, was, was and what is the actual South Pole look like? You know, the pole is not the barber pole that you see in pictures that's ringed by the flags of the treaty right. nations. That's quite a ways off at, at near the geodesic mm -hmm. dome. And visitors go there and get their picture taken and everything. But the fact is, the real South Pole, 90 South, is, uh, I don't know the distance, but it's quite a ways in a, in a flat prairie-like mm -hmm. field of ice. And it's a tattered green flag on top of a bamboo pole that's 15 feet high. That is the South Pole. That's amazing. That's what you I mean. You kind of suspect a cement monument. I mean, you. I want to ask you one thing, if you've ever dared to do one thing. You, you've scuba dived, jumped out of planes, flown <laughs> planes, sailed around the world. Have you ever had a hot dog off a New York street vendor? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have, as a matter of fact. There's a, and you survived there's an that. Adventure. Right. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back. We will dig into an excellent book, find out what, why Hugh Downs wrote this book for you and for me, called 50 to Forever. We'll be right back.